Welcome to the webinar, Responding to the Impact of COVID-19 on Refugees, presented by the International Vaccine Access Center at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Before we get started, I wanna let participants know that we will have a short Q&A session at the end. So please enter your questions into the Q&A box and we will get to them after the presentation. There's also a chat box, so please go ahead and introduce yourself there and enter your comments that aren't questions. During the presentation, a couple of polls will be used, so please submit your answer when they appear. This webinar will be recorded and available after the presentation. Thank you for attending. I'll now hand it off to Bill to introduce the speakers for today's presentation. Great, thank you, Andrew, and welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar on responding to the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on refugees. Um, this uh, we this uh, webinar, as Andrew said, is, is hosted by the International Vaccine Access Center um, in collaboration with the Center for Humanitarian Health. We have two speakers today, um, Dr. Sean Trulove, who's an assistant scientist in the Department of International Health and a member of both the Center for Humanitarian Health and the International Vaccine Access Center and Dr. Paul Spiegel, who's the director uh, of the Center for Humanitarian Health and a professor of the practice here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. As Andrew said, we'll be having a couple polls throughout the, uh, the talk and I will moderate a question and answer session at the end. So I'll turn it over to Sean to start our webinar. Thanks, Bill and Andrew. Uh, we really appreciate you guys having us here to highlight some of our uh, important work and bring attention to these uh, often overlooked and vulnerable populations. Um, so to start us off, we really wanted to kind of uh, focus a lot of this thinking about, you know, have major outbreaks occurred uh, of SARS-CoV-2 among these refugee and displaced person populations around the world? So we want to ask uh, you participants to add, to really assess you know whether or not you think outbreaks have occurred. So please take a moment to do that right now. All right, so generally it seems that the majority of the participants think that there has been a major outbreak among uh, refugee or displaced populations. Um, though there is uh, some, some um, uh, heterogeneity in the response. So we'll get into this a little bit. Um, and this kind of frames really the challenges we face in this, uh, this realm. Uh, next, please. So there are uh, 25 countries across the world that currently are affected by humanitarian emergencies and have humanitarian, or that, uh, that have a humanitarian response plan. They consist of people affected by conflict or natural disasters. Uh, they may be non-displaced non or displaced, such as refugees or internally displaced persons, IDPs. And the, this latter group, the refugees and IDPs, are really what we're focused on here in this talk and in our work. Um, and uh, as you can see here, to date, there have been around 600,000 uh, confirmed cases and 20,000 confirmed deaths among these countries where these humanitarian populations live. Um, for many reasons that we will get into, some of which here, uh, we think, and I'm sure many of you also think, these numbers are uh, extremely under uh, representing the true numbers of both infections, uh, cases, and uh, deaths in these populations. Next. Um, so the COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan was recently, uh, was developed and was recently revised to now ask for about $10 billion. Uh, importantly, only about 1.6 billion of that has been dispersed as of the middle of July. Um, this is a really important and um, big problem because we have a, a very large population at substantial risk. 
Um, nearly 80% of refugees and 100% of IDPs live in these countries with weak and economic systems. Um, and uh, a really critical uh, occurrence that has, that has been a part of this pandemic is that about 167 states have closed their borders to people coming in. Uh, and 57 of these are not accepting uh, people seeking asylum, which is actually against international law. But all of this highlights really the, um, the magnitude of the problem among these vulnerable people in these uh, countries. Next. So uh, as I mentioned, we are focused in, in our work and in uh, this talk on displaced persons. Uh, these are uh, about 26 million refugees and 46 million internally displaced people, uh, making up about 80 million people total um, with asylum seekers and Venezuelans. Um, and uh, about uh, half of these live, uh, or sorry, half of the refugees live in camps, which is uh, the focus of most of our modeling work. Um, but this just gives you the, the, an idea of the scale of this population globally. Next. Uh, so, um, much of this pandemic and much of our work has really occurred in what I like to think of as phases. Uh, the first phase when the virus was beginning to spread throughout, uh, spread in China and then to other places in the world was really this, this phase of preparing for what's coming. Um, it wasn't quite declared a pandemic yet. Um, but it was starting to pop up in different countries. We had Italy, we had Iran. Um, and so there was a notion there that it was likely going to continue to spread. Um, and so what we wanted to do really early on was uh, sound the alarm and bring attention to the risks uh, and, and potential impacts in some of these populations. Uh, and so we did this through uh, initially a report that we put out focused on the uh, Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. Um, and that became a preprint and is now published in PLOS Medicine, as you can see here. Next. Uh, so the, the idea of focusing on the Rohingya population early on was the scale of the population and what we believed was the high potential for both uh, introduction because of its proximity uh, to China and within Bangladesh, which is another highly densely population, populated uh, country, um, as well as uh, some characteristics of this camp itself. Uh, with a population of about a, or more than a million people, uh, an extremely high density of that population, uh, as you'll see here, with about 46,000 people per square kilometer, which is more than four times that of New York City, um, the expectation for high transmission is there. Uh, and we previously estimated uh, m substantially higher rates of transmission of diphtheria in this population than was seen elsewhere uh, in other places in the world. And along with that high potential for transmission, there is also a low capacity to treat. We did a review and had some discussions with a lot of the partners on the ground there to try to figure out what the hospitalization capacity was for this population. We found that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, there were about 340 beds available um, with some surge capacity on top of that. But this puts their beds per thousand population at about uh, one fifth of that seen in New York City. And as many of you may know, uh, in New York City, they uh, quickly ran out of uh, health healthcare capacity, and there were decisions being made on on who to treat. Um, there was a substantial overflow developed, and um, they had hospital ships and all of these things. So it really became clear, looking at this population and its characteristics, that if and when uh, introduction occurred, there was likely uh, a substantial need. But really to understand what that need was, we had to do uh, this modeling study. Next. Um, and this was pretty early on. So we really focused here on, on transmission scenarios rather than um, what I'll get into later, which are the control or the non-pharmaceutical intervention scenarios. Uh, but this was really considering, um, we have this mod uh, a 
sorry, uh, considering these different levels of transmission that we thought were reasonable at the time. Um, so we have this uh, high transmission scenario, which is using some of that research that we did previously for diphtheria and uh, increasing transmission above what was being seen uh, in the US and Europe and China, um, which is represented here by this blue curve, that moderate transmission scenario is an R naught of about two. Um, but we also wanted to be realistic and consider a lower transmission scenario um, as a potential with behavior change and other things uh, that resembled something like um, what occurred in the US after control measures uh, were put into place. But you can see in all of these scenarios that uh, the number of infections uh, among a population of 600,000, which is that smaller, or sorry, that, that uh, condensed subset of the, the Rohingya camps in the Kuta Palang, Palakali uh, area, um, that even with uh, the lower transmission scenarios, you see substantial infection within the first year and substantial deaths. Um, and so to, um, to really understand the, you know, not just the infections and the out, or to understand the, the outcomes along with the infections, we also had to think about what are the characteristics of this population and what potential outcomes will result from that. Next. Uh, and so, as many of you may know, one of our best, best proxies for severity so far um, is age distribution. Uh, we found with this population, as compared to uh, China or the US, um, because of the younger age structure, we would expect to have uh, substantially lower severity. So lower uh, hospitalization, lower critical care needs, lower uh, death from infection. Um, probably some, somewhere around half of what we would expect to see in the US. Next. And that translates into our hospitalization capacity needs. Um, and as I mentioned, with uh, 340 beds available, uh, you can see on this plot here, this, this is the hospitalization capacity required when considering how long people are hospitalized for. Um, this red dashed line was that, uh, that 340 beds. So in all of the scenarios, um, you see that the hospitalization capacity was expected to be exceeded ra rather quickly. Um, and so this really prompted um, some early concern that uh, some, some action needed to be taken. Next. And uh, fortunately, you know, while, while we do acknowledge um, and we believed early on, as well as many others, that distancing was impossible, there was quite a bit of focus on developing that, that hospitalization capacity and isolation capacity. Um, and as you can see here, this uh, article on the right indicates that there were um, two isolation centers opened of about 200 each um, through efforts from UNHCR in Cox's Bazaar. Next. Um, so moving on from the Rohingya population, uh, we began to work with UNHCR, OCHA, and MSF to run uh, similar projections for more than 200 refugee camps and IDP camps in 29 countries to help support their efforts uh, there, as well as their staffing, uh, understanding of healthcare needs and supply needs. Uh, and to do this, we've been uh, using the COVID scenario pipeline, so I have to give a plug to that. This is our um, modeling pipeline that we've been developing as part of the Johns Hopkins Infectious Disease Dynamics Group. Uh, you can see our preprint here, as well as uh, the open source code on GitHub. And this is, this is a modeling pipeline that we have developed to use in uh, various settings around the world. Um, and we're using it here for, to model these uh, refugee camps and IDP camps. Uh, next. So one of the interesting things um, about looking at all these camps is that we really do actually have to consider them individually and uh, generate bespoke models. As, as many of you are probably aware, there are 
a number of uh, models out there that are being produced to look at the outcomes across countries, uh, to av allow users to put in their own input, their own uh, parameters, such as the COVID-19 scenarios.org website. Um, but uh, the heterogeneity within these, uh, these refugee and displaced person camps is such that uh, there needs to be quite a bit of um, characterization of the populations in the models to appropriately attribute uh, outcomes and severity. So this is, um, this is 128 refugee camps uh, across uh, the world. And you can see here that we have a, a very wide range of expected IFR uh, as was estimated from the age distributions, um, ranging from about under 0.1 percent to over 0.55. And to give you a perspective, uh, the US and Europe are expected to have an IFR of around 0.5 to 1 percent, potentially a bit higher. Um, so what this tells us is that there's not only a substantial amount of heterogeneity among these camps, but they also are expected to have substantially lower uh, severity in terms of their age distributions than we've seen elsewhere. Next. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this quick to show the complexity of this. So this, within this orange box here, these are camps with a mean age of about 24 to 25. Yet that mean age doesn't tell us nearly enough um, alone. We have to consider the full age distribution. Uh, you can see that even with those very close mean ages, you have an IFR of under 0.1 all the way up to 0.4. Next. <clears throat> uh, to really look at this, to understand this a little bit better, we can look at two camps. So these are two camps from the same country, both with about the same population size. Um, but if you look in these red boxes and these older age groups, and this is where most of the severity from COVID-19 is occurring, um, there are slight differences as compared to the gray underlying boxes, which are the mean age distributions uh, from all of the camps within this particular country. And even those slight differences uh, lead to a substantial, substantial differences in severity. Next. So this is, these are those same camps, uh, and these are, what is this, six camps from within the same country. Um, those slight differences lead to these two camps having uh, IFRs on completely different ends of the spectrum. And so this uh, heterogeneity and these, these specific characteristics uh, really requires some of this bespoke modeling to get um, really at the uh, outcomes that we would expect. Next. So in addition to these heterogeneities and the characteristics of these populations, uh, we have moved to incorporate more scenarios of control, just as many others have across the field uh, within populations from the US through Europe, um, through Asia, and elsewhere, um, now we are in this, this phase two where people, where the pandemic is widespread and, and different types of interventions are being, being done to really try to flatten the curve, as everybody's saying. Um, so as our first in analysis uh, did not include interventions, that was done early in the pandemic before we thought there was uh, much we can do, particularly in that setting. Um, we have begun to look at uh, what are the possible interventions of control that could be done in these. Um, and it's still quite unclear in most of these settings, uh, but through collaboration with many of our partners on the ground, we've developed uh, a set of scenarios that we think are uh, potentially realistic and capture what could be done. Uh, next. Uh, so, um, this is a nice figure here on the left that uh, some of our colleagues have developed in, at Hopkins uh, through the health intervention tracking for COVID-19 or HIT COVID project. And this is where they are tracking through user input all the interventions that are occurring across different countries around the world. Uh, as you can see here with all of these dots, uh, especially if you look vertically, 
um, the interventions occurring ac around the world are occurring in these kind of phases. And they're phases of scale up and scale back. Um, and that is, uh, this is an interesting and important uh, control aspect to account for, but even within these camps, because there is the same thing occurring where there's shutdowns and closures, uh, behavior change, and so um, you can see here, this is uh, on the right hand side, this is, um, these are the modeling projections for one camp. Um, and you can see in the blue that there are various small humps representing some of those phases of control and what, what we expect to occur with those phases. Um, but unfortunately, as Paul will get into in a little bit, we still continue to lack a really true understanding of what is occurring in, in these populations globally, um, what is occurring in these camps, uh, how much control is happening, what types of behavior change is occurring, and really how effective it is because, of these, pop because these populations can be so different from some of the other populations from which we're developing uh, our estimates of these uh, control measures, like the US and Europe. Um, and so uh, that is some critical work that is continuing and needs more attention. Um, and Paul will get into that shortly. Next. Um, but what we do know is that masks are likely uh, feasible and effective. So this is some uh, preliminary work that we are doing with some partners on the ground to look at the effectiveness of masks in refugee camps uh, and look at how effective specific distribution programs might be to limit and reduce the impact of COVID-19 among camps. Um, again, this is very preliminary, uh, but this is really trying to look at what the impact of household versus community mask wearing might be and what the impact of the uh, baseline effective reproductive num number might be on that. Uh, paradigm. So uh, what we see here in the right column, the box, the plots that have the green in them, these represent a setting that's more like the U.S., where we have um, a set of NPIs that have been put in place to reduce transmission quite a bit, um, getting us down to an effective R of 1.6. Now you can clearly see the the impact of masks here. Uh, where even with only 50% community mask prevalence and no household mask wearing, we are able to get R or R, the effective reproductive number under one. So that means we have established control with relatively low mask wearing. Um, if we, we increase uh, mask wearing in the household to 100% once someone is symptomatic, we can drop that down to 30% community mask wearing. Now on the right hand side, we see this is more potentially more like a refugee setting where we have limited ability to have social distancing, uh, isolation, some of these other measures. So we still have an effective reproductive number of 2.5. Uh, we still see a substantial impact. We're not getting at the R of one yet, but we still are dropping R well below that initial uh, baseline level. So that's again, flattening the curve, uh, and reducing transmission substantially. Um, now, if we bring in additional household uh, mask wearing, which is the bottom two, uh, we can reduce that even more. Um, but again, this is preliminary and uh, hopefully this can help us understand a little bit better uh, how to implement mask wearing and distribution programs throughout these populations. Next, with that, I'll hand that over, hand it over to Paul for phase three. Great, uh, thank you, Sean, and thanks, Bill and Andrew, for the opportunity to present to, to all the colleagues. Um, so phase three is what's next, and um, we don't pretend to, by any means, uh, know everything of what will be coming next, but we'd like to talk to you at, let's say, a broader level on certain areas, such as the, uh, future infection risks, some of the treatment and vaccination strategies, and also what we have learned. And so I'm going to actually start with what we have learned, which is um, we have a, a COVID-19 humanitarian website 
Uh, you can see it here at the top. And this is with uh, the London School and the Geneva Center for Humanitarian Studies, as well as Hopkins. And this came about because we were more and more seeing a lot of guidance coming out, many of which was not necessarily humanitarian, but some was. But by its very nature, guidance is, uh, guidance is generic and in all contexts, but I would say particularly in some of the humanitarian contexts, there's huge variability. So next slide, please. So what this shows is are the countries where we have actually interviewed or people have uploaded their experiences across the world. And what we've been trying to do is to look at, uh, you can verify by having refugees, IDPs, non-displaced, migrants, you can have camp, non-camp, etc. all the way, and then you choose a specific area. And one of the areas I'd like to talk about is triage and isolation. And what we found is um, a huge variation in terms of how people are, uh, sorry, how uh, either NGOs or governments are triaging, particularly refugees and IDPs when they come to the health center. And one of the big areas that we've seen, and I'll give some examples, is that testing, not surprisingly, can take, uh, there aren't enough tests in many situations and the results can take a long time. And we've, we've noted two or three cases at least where either due to government regulations, they're testing uh, when they have a suspected case, and again, a suspected case could be many things. It could certainly not be COVID-19. The suspected cases are taken and actually isolated together in an area nearby where the confirmed cases are. You can imagine beyond not being a very public health uh, strong initiative with a group like this that has so much mistrust of authorities. Um, one can imagine the uh, the increasing mistrust and therefore not coming up to actually get tested and the relatively low test rates. And that's certainly a major issue that we're seeing with the Rohingya refugees, but we've also in some of these field studies have found it in Myanmar itself in the, amongst the, um, the Rohingya in Rakhine state. And so we have been looking at this in terms of psychosocial issues. We've been looking in terms of, um, non-COVID uh, non COVID sensitive uh, issues, like how are we dealing with maternal child health? And so I encourage you to use the, have a look at this, the field experiences. We're not necessarily finding all the answers, but we're certainly able to document many of the challenges. Next slide, please. Another big issue that's come up consistently uh, is looking at equity across, uh, across the board. And so we're talking globally equity between high income countries and middle and low income countries. We're talking about even within a country, uh, there are many populations within the countries who are, who are nationals, but still may be discriminated against. And then finally, we're going to be getting to a situation where I think most of us are very concerned about which are the non nationals, uh, particularly refugees and migrants and particularly undocumented migrants. Next slide, please. And so we're looking at uh, and already discussing with, uh, with IVAC and other groups about vaccine when there is a vaccine. And there's been a tremendous amount of discussion. We've already seen a lot of high income countries already trying to um, have a certain amount of a va potential vaccine for their own uh, people. And in some ways this is, is understandable because this is a pandemic and governments are there primarily to protect their own populations. Um, but there's, a larger issue that needs to be discussed in terms of prioritization um, globally, but also within a country. Even within a country, if you're dealing just with nationals, but you have a tremendous amount of uh, whether non-nationals, refugees or migrants, and you're only vaccinating or giving treatment to a certain group, um, that's going to cause public health problems longer term because you're not addressing the, the whole situation. Um, we have been, and we're clear that Gavi, and there are another bunch of different groups that are discussing this, but I think what makes the situation quite unique, a pandemic compared to other situations like Ebola, is that it is affecting every, uh, every government, and therefore we're seeing both the response. Uh, we're not seeing a massive surge, understandably, like we did in Ebola in West Africa or DRC. And we're also not seeing uh, the funding, and as Sean mentioned, out of the 10 billion, a very small percentage is actually even uh, been provided to the humanitarian response plan. So the pandemic is, again, understandably, but it is changing the way a response would be traditionally in a humanitarian set setting. And it's having both, I think, short-term and very long-term repercussions. Next slide, please. 
Stigma and discrimination, we saw pre-COVID, we've seen across the world increase um, of, of uh, anti-migrant, anti-refugee and, and populism. But we're seeing more and more COVID uh, increasing the mistrust and actually a lot of misinformation that's occurring. And we've been focusing a lot on the Rohingya because uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of studies and a lot of uh, information is there. But uh, the UN came out a while back and Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, I very much like this quote, said, we must act now to strengthen the immunity of our societies against the virus of hate. We're seeing huge backlashes, for example, amongst the Venezuelans in Colombia right now with a massive return of Venezuelans to a country that is already very hard hit and not able to um, provide health care for their populations. Um, the other concern, and I'm going to get to this in the next slide, maybe you can go to the next slide, is that we're, besides the populism and the uh, anti-migration, anti-refugee settings, we're actually seeing certain governments use public health orders or the, the, the logic of public health to actually set back certain accepted international laws, and particularly in this case, the international refugee law, um, which says that governments must be able to provide asylum for people fearing persecution. And we're seeing public health orders being misused to keep people out of a country. And particularly, what well, we'll talk about here in the United States, we, there was a CDC order that clearly um, has stopped people, people who are seeking asylum coming over the southern border. Um, furthermore, and bizarrely, that you know, the, the, one of the laws was that we're very concerned about that but migrants and refugees would actually be increasing um, uh, transmission within the United States. But the United States is so badly off that in fact, there's also been now an expedited removal, particularly of Guatemalans and flying them back home. And there is some discussion of whether actually the return of the Guatemalans that the, who may have actually uh, 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 um, been infected here in the US may have been fueling an epidemic in, uh, in Guatemala. Currently, there is a public health order that's, uh, sorry, a, a, a rule right now that's in the Federal Register that's talking about expanding this, uh, this, this public health order for future pandemics, and they're even using um, other diseases. And this is clearly a, a situation where there's a misuse of, misuse of public health. And we do have um, tomorrow, there'll be uh, Physicians for Human Rights, uh, Human Rights First, Columbia and ourselves will be having a webinar discussing this specifically. Next slide, please. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we have a couple more slides, but we wanted to, given everything we've said, Sean discussing the various modeling issues and what we've seen, we want to redo this poll now for all of you. So if you would please uh, spend uh, 30 seconds filling this out. And this is have you have major outbreaks, not just an outbreak, but major outbreaks occurred amongst refugee populations around the world. So please fill this out and then we'll compare to the previous uh, poll. How are we doing, Andrew? Okay, so some change a little bit. Um, I don't know, Andrew, if you're able to compare, probably not the previous one. I did a screenshot, but I can't find it right now. But it looks like the yeses went down a little bit and the noes or not noes went up a little bit. I think that's what we were actually looking for um, overall. Um, and we're going to discuss this now. So next slide, please. And the slide after. So have major outbreaks occurred thus far? I think there's it's a question mark at this point. Um, again, concentrating on the Rohingya uh, refugees, I put into the open questions that thus far there have been um, one only 1,747 tests with 66 positive cases. And I believe there have been five or six deaths now. Um, for a population of nearly 1 million people, that is a you know, ridiculously small amount. And there could be a lot of reasons why we're not seeing uh, these outbreaks thus far. And I think most people think in terms of the Rohingya situation that there are massively more 
cases that have gone undetected. And so some of the issues that uh, Sean has already hinted at is when you have a significantly younger population, you may have much more infection, some of it asymptomatic, but um, fewer deaths. Um, some of it may be also uh, many of these situations, open air, people are not as indoors, um, don't have mass population, mass transit. Um, is physical distancing possible? Uh, for example, it's going to be extremely hard with such high population, with such high density, but we know early on in the camps, many of the camps, uh, mass distributions were changed so that they would have fewer people. Schools were closed, markets were closed. Um, the problem is that can't last forever. So there is likely um, significantly more uh, outbreaks than we know of thus far. Off the top of my head, I know that there were a couple infections that were recorded in uh, a refugee camp in Djibouti. There have been some in infections in some IDP settings in Darfur. But one of the problems is how can we improve our knowledge um, while also making sure that we don't put these vulnerable populations more at risk? Because as we've spoken about, uh, when you look at what's happening in Lebanon right now, with the economy in free fall, it would be very easy to make the Syrian refugees as, as the, the fall person's people, and we need to avoid that. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, that we found interesting was a relatively recent report on the 13th of July by IOM and ACAPS, again, looking in the Rohingya setting. Um, this, was annex, this was qualitative, and they, they clearly said more research needs to be done. But there were a tremendous, was, has been, and still are a tremendous amount of rumors and misinformation in the camps. And so early on during this qualitative study, it was found that many people did discuss uh, that they had, uh, there were a lot of flu-like symptoms going on uh, in the camps, but people were not going to the health centers. They also, people have said, and they able were even to identify numerous deaths that have occurred that actually were not reported and were not even buried in the usual cemeteries, but elsewhere in order to avoid make, asking, um, to, to avoid the authorities being aware of what was happening in these camps. And if you look at that third quote down there, another ish thing that's a little bit scary is people have shared and remarked openly that they no longer fear the virus because they were sick during this time period of when this occurred. Now, again, I think this is, um, this is more anecdotal, um, but it, it, it emphasizes some of the reasons why perhaps people have not been getting tested and um, also why we're not seeing necessarily the same amount of numbers of infections and possibly numbers of deaths in these camps as we are and even compared to um, just the, the host population in Cox's Bazaar. Last, next slide, please. So how can we really know what's happening? Um, number one is looking at actually mortality data and also I would add in there uh, bed occupancy data. If we are seeing not much testing going on, but we are seeing more and more hospital beds are being, uh, being occupied, ICUs or where there are no ICUs, people that need oxygen. And when we're seeing an increase in mortality that we haven't seen previously in this pre previous time, that may be a very gross indicator that there are, um, there's a lot more transit, transmission that is occurring. Another area that we need a lot more work on is RCCE, is risk communication and community engagement to better understand um, how people are, what people are thinking about uh, in terms of their networking or their physical distancing, how, how they're interpreting isolation. And I realize I didn't say something in terms of the vaccination. One of the big concerns about vaccination in the future is again, this misinformation and mistrust amongst the population. So even if a vaccine does become available, will, uh, will people actually refuse to, to take this vaccine? Well, certainly we're gonna have that in many, many countries throughout the world, but it may be even more severe in some of these communities where they have so much mistrust of populations already. Um, ultimately, I think we'll see some test serology tests to be able to better know how many people were ultimately affected or had been ultimately affected, but that may take a while and given the in low resource settings that may not be their priority at this point. 
Um, we've been working, as Sean mentioned, closely with uh, both IOM, OCHA, UNHCR, and then they've been working with MSF. One of the big concerns and why we, other than the Rohingya camps, we have not um, discussed our data publicly in terms of the modeling is that Number one, it's, it, there are scenarios. It doesn't mean that this is going to happen, but there's a lot of concern that if this data becomes public, it may be used um, unfairly uh, to discriminate against uh, humanitarian populations, whether they be migrants, refugees, IDPs, and that therefore what we, yet there is a lot of data out there that we're not, we and a lot of other people don't know about. So perhaps there can be a structured and a protected way amongst a few uh, key organizations to be able to start sharing some of this data so we can actually better understand the situation because right now the many of the 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 models that are being used um, are not necessarily what is happening on the ground and we need better data for, for that and ultimately to improve the interventions and then finally my last point is uh, how can we know what's really happening we need to know not just what's happening in terms of COVID-19 we need to know what's happening in terms of other health uh, situations. And we've talked about this, that, that there's a big concern, uh, just as there was, in, was during the Ebola outbreaks of people dying from non-Ebola related uh, and morbidity and mortality. There's a big concern here and there's a lot that we can do. Um, we have been in the Rohingya camps and some of the camps in, um, in, uh, in Darfur, we're seeing a dramatic reduction in the number of people coming to, understandably perhaps, coming to the clinics. What does that mean in terms of uh, antenatal coverage, in terms of women giving birth uh, in health centers? What does it mean in terms of malaria or diabetes and other non-communicable diseases? There are ways to be able to capture this data, but it's not yet been systematically done. So I'm going to just next slide, please, which I think is the acknowledgements. We want to thank uh, all the organizations and, uh, uh, and colleagues on this, uh, on this slide. And then next slide, I think over to you, Bill. Great, thank you, Sean. And thank you, Paul, uh, for that wonderful presentation and overview. What we're going to do now in the, re um, in the remaining about 15 minutes is open this up to uh, questions. And I ask that you use the Q&A uh, box in or to insert your questions. I'll be looking primarily there. I know we've had some discussion, ongoing discussion, really rich discussion in the chat box as well. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll we'll just uh, uh, try to um, get through as many questions as possible. And so I'm gonna start with Kelly's uh, question um, and Paul, I think this relates to your discussion of uh, stigma and discrimination, particularly among the Rohingya. How do you anticipate the Bangladeshi government will handle the limited number of critical care beds in Cox's Bazar that are, de that are designated for both local Bangladeshis and the Rohingya? So it's an allocation of rare, you know, limited resources, healthcare resources. Mm. Um, you know, there's interesting, there's, the answer is it's, we have to be very cautious is that for the most part and we for the most part governments are not stating openly that they will be understandably at this point restricting um, uh, whether it be tests whether it be beds solely for nationals and in Cox's Bazaar at the moment um, there was one and now there are two PCR machines um, and they have not been restricting the government uh, bed specifically for, uh, for their nationals. But I think many of us believe that if the, if the infections and particularly if the morbidity and the mortality become quite severe, that this will happen. And one of the concerns that we've been having with some of the organizations we've been working with is that um, you can't openly discuss that and have this in your preparedness plans because it would be quite insulting to the government, understandably. So I think there is the reality at this point is, and we've, I've been asked this question by a bunch of reporters, is that we cannot give, except maybe only one example where a government has openly said at this point, we will not include refugees or migrants. Um, but I still think that that may happen. There'll be a good chance that that will happen when push comes to shove. Great. And Diego's question was very much related to that, uh, the impact um, if there's segregation and disregard by the local government. And I think you, you address that. It's not, it, 
difficult to discuss explicitly, but uh, it, it may very well happen, particularly if there's increased disease severity in the local populations. Okay, um, Leila asked uh, actually for Paul, your input on the sanctions recently imposed by the US on Syria, especially during the pandemic on a country that is entering its 10th year of civil war. Um, maybe how, how that may impact. You know, um, one, it's, it's beyond sort of my, I would say my expertise and it would become more on a personal as opposed to a, a professional um, comment. So I'll probably punt that. Mm -hmm. But just to say right now we have been like everyone else following, following what's happening in Syria and there have been now some cases in Idlib. Um, and the other place that where there have been a lot of cases reported, but again, insufficient data is Yemen. Um, and how to actually get good data and better understand, uh, I don't know. And in, in terms of the sanctions themselves, it's just the issue is an age old. How do you deal with sanctions and how much are they hurting the actual population versus the government? And that's for, I think, the political science and economists to deal with. And, and Breda asked about more kind of qualitative uh, research that could be done, focus group discussions. Um, are, are any are those kind of things happening? You told some of the stories from the, the Rohingya, but more qualitative uh, research. Sean, do you want to answer some of that? Then I can come in. Um, yeah, so so that is being done. And that that is um, what this report that Paul mentioned uh, really gets into. And this, this was a very in-depth um, project that was undergone by um, IOM and ACAPS. And they used Rohingya informants uh, to perform that analysis. Um, I don't know whether or not that's happening in other camps, mm -hmm. um, but before that report, we have a, a pretty good sense that there was, there was very little uh, information coming out of that population without such an exercise. So it seems like going forward, these types mm -hmm. of things will be really necessary. Great. And Annie asked, maybe related to that, what does this mean for response analysis by humanitarian agencies and where, where should their focus lie? Is there other particular areas that are kind of high priority um, in terms of in getting information and analyses? Yeah, again, it's, it's, a, um, it's a challenging setting. Um, we still don't know what's happened in a lot of these places, places and it's hard to prioritize which camp um, to do these kind of efforts, especially in a setting or a situation where there's not a lot of international travel, there's a lot of focus in your own home populations. Um, but uh, I think where effort can be done is um, trying to get data and collect data um, mm -hmm. and get it to people who can, can use it, which continues to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. And Gita asked about peer-to-peer -peer communication strategies. Is this something that's being considered or, or been used, um, particularly in this setting or the pandemic? Maybe I, I'll, yeah. if I can, also just to mention what Sean was saying, uh, add on to that in terms of data, is that there still is a lot of data out there that can be used that we're not, um, we're not using. For example, in terms of better analyzing the health information system in simple terms, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, numbers of people coming to the clinics, uh, types of diseases they're coming for, bed occupancy, these sort of things will be better be able to help us understand the non-COVID component of this. Mm -hmm. um, also, there are what we're not doing and we'd like to see, and this was one, our last point being shown, is that there isn't sort of one, one database that can actually look at who is getting sick, uh, what, are their, what are their exact age, sex, comorbidities, who is dying, all of this is going to be able to help us. Mm -hmm. And similarly for the peer-to-peer, -peer, I am aware of some uh, occurring. I mean, you, you, firstly, you have a lot of community health workers where that's already happening and the community health workers are from that area but a lot of other the other data that we need that we i don't believe we have yet sufficiently is looking at how is physical distancing occurring i mean it, it may not be able to occur, occur in the same way but maybe people are looking at only a certain part person of the household going out and that they're shielding other people in the, in in uh, certain other parts of the of their household depending on the household yep. and 
finally, I just want to mention that we haven't talked about a lot of the out of camp other than maybe Idlib in Yemen. Um, Sean and I were careful not to do too much out of camp uh, estimations for a variety of reasons. It's complicated, but also in camp is very clear with the numbers. Out of camp, we need to be use already some of the modeling that exists for the nationals and not uh, exa um, exacerbate numbers of people that could be infected in refugee situations and already make the situation worse between the host communities. Yes, and Paul, some of those, uh, your, your comments that you just made uh, related to Haley's question, you know, some of the non-COVID impact. And, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a tension that all countries are facing, you know, social distancing, isolation, lockdowns, or the economic trade-off and but particularly in stress populations like this where poverty and food insecurity may be greater. So how do you kind of balance this um, yeah. uh, this trade-off? And I think that's what you were kind of getting at that it's, it's probably not an all or none, but there may be different ways of doing social distancing and protecting individuals in these settings. But there also may be some weird paradoxes in a way is that in many camp settings, in uh, refugees and IDPs are actually getting food distribution. Um, whereas in urban slums, just nationals, that's not occurring. So when you have a lockdown, in some ways a lockdown uh, in, a, in camp situations may be easier than a lockdown in an urban situation where people need to work day to day to get food. So there are these odd, uh, odd differences um, that are occurring. Great. Uh, a question from a, a long time colleague, um, many people may recognize, Ron Waldman asks, suppose a vaccine does become available, has there been discussion at UNHCR as to how prioritization among refugees would occur? Who would be prioritized in camps, settings where there might be some vaccine but not enough for all? And this is really a, a question that everyone's facing everywhere at the global level, national level, um, but it's maybe particularly acute in, in these settings. You want to comment on that, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, this is being discussed at, at all levels, and I know I'm, I know both. It has to be discussed at the as you just mentioned, the national level. I um, and there have been discussions, but at the broader level of, for example, um, who, who will deal with non non nationals, uh, refugees, and migrants. I'm still very concerned that it's being discussed, and everyone says this is very important, but I certainly haven't seen yet. The specifics of how this will be and I, I am and I think Ron would know better than most we're all very concerned that again when push comes to shove it's going to be nationals that are going to receive this and we have a long history of looking at antiretroviral therapy early on with HIV and refugees and migrants were pushed out at the beginning because governments uh, again, understandably, perhaps, but they favored their, their nationals. And we need to think about that now. And I, I think people are thinking about it, but there really does not appear to be concrete responses yet. And then Holly asked uh, about um, mental health uh, issues related to the pandemic, which uh, also is a global health, con a, a global concern, um, but again, perhaps exacerbated in these settings. Yeah, there's, there's, there's been a fair bit of, of work already on that. And what's interesting is that, just as you're saying, it's global. We've all seen an increase in SGBV, uh, or at least been recorded in many situations, primarily intimate partner violence uh, here. And it's the same, same situations. I mean, I think in terms of refugees and IDPs and humanitarian, a lot of this is in, in this epidemic is a, or pandemic is almost an exacerbation of some of the issues that are affecting everyone worldwide. The biggest thing I think that's unique is just this classic mistrust of authorities, which is understandable, um, but we're seeing that exemplified. Yeah. yeah. Sean, maybe this, this one is for you. This is from Judy asking about similar respiratory infections or with a similar uh, reproductive number that have shown limited infection, hospitalization, or, or mortality. What do we know about other respiratory tract infections with similar transmissibility? In this setting? Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I, I, I don't really know how to, how to answer that. Um, this is, um, you know, this is, a, this is a novel pathogen that in which we have no immunity, uh, unlike some of the other outbreaks of influenza and other things like that, which 
come through the population, but there's some baseline level of immunity, um, the ability of this to really burn through a population because of that lack of immunity, that full susceptibility uh, makes this even greater concern. And, um, you know, as we've seen elsewhere, it has makes it have the ability to overwhelm health systems. Um, and that's, you know, that's true in these settings as well as uh, every other population around the world. Yeah. Sean, maybe I'll just pick up on a question uh, related. I know in a lot of your work, you consider connectivity between populations as an important driver of, of outbreaks. And um, do we know enough about the connectivity of these populations? Are these insular enough or some of them right. insular enough so that the, the actual number of introductions is, is quite low? Yeah, and that's another challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, we made some assumptions that this is limited in these populations. Mm -hmm. um, and some very, some of these camps very well may be quite uh, isolated and somewhat closed. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know from talking to partners that many of these have regular movement between camps that are close mm -hmm. by from a camp to the host population to go to the market um, and otherwise. Um, but then some are, some are restricted. So it really uh, depends on the setting. Um, so yeah, it makes it quite a challenging situation to really account for that accurately. Yeah. Rita asked about mass community temperature testing as a, I assume as a way of screening. I, I think we know that a fair number of infection, a large proportion of infections actually are asymptomatic and, you know, perhaps even, even more so in a, in these kind of populations with a skewed age distribution to younger individuals. So, um, but I'll let maybe Sean, I don't know if you want to just address that briefly, whether that's. A... Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that is definitely a challenging thing to do in these populations, especially with this age group and the expected asymptomatic rates. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also know that even among those, you know, populations in the U.S. and Europe, that temperature screening doesn't necessarily work that well, yeah. because there are there's pre-symptomatic transmission. Um, there are people who even are symptomatic with other things and don't have a fever. So it's um, maybe not the right, uh, it, you know, it may be a baseline effect a tool to use for things like food distribution centers or other types of mass gatherings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Natasha asks about um, kind of the role of international organizations of a particularly, you know, how we move beyond, uh, how we integrate more local uh, efforts and, and involve, uh, get coordination uh, and, and engagement with the refugees and non-nationals. Yeah, maybe, I mean, it would, this has been complicated. And as I mentioned, in some, there's been a push within the humanitarian community for localization for a long period of time. This is actually making this happen in many ways because you don't have the same movement. You don't have the number of NGOs responding in the same way for the reasons we know from closed borders to quarantine to, um, uh, to just be taking care of their own families um, as well. So this, there is a significant I would say right now we're seeing a significant increase in working with national NGOs and just the, the communities to be able to respond here. Um, but it's complex, right? Because a lot of the training hasn't necessarily occurred. Um, one doesn't know the quality, sort of the classic arguments that one would use in the past of how hard it is to localize, but there's been no choice here. So it's been incre it's increased, but to what effect? It's very hard to know. Yeah. And then uh, we're, we've got one minute left. So uh, um, Sangeeta asked about other, other epidemics, outbreaks, uh, there are lessons learned from those. I'm sure there are uh, a lot of lessons learned and uh, there are many, his long history of infectious disease outbreaks in these settings. You know, Sean or Paul, do you wanna? Sean, why don't you go ahead? Why don't you get oh, um, Yeah, like we, you know, we, we've learned a bit about what we think um, transmission will look like from some of these other outbreaks. Yeah. Um, and we do know quite a bit about uh, the vulnerabilities of these populations for these, mm -hmm. these types of uh, outbreaks. But again, this is a, a novel uh, pathogen that's everywhere in the world creating a whole bunch of questions that we don't quite know how to answer yet. 
That's a great ending, Sean. <laughs> There's still a lot left to, to learn. And so we're at, the, we're at the end of the hour. I want to thank our, our speakers, Dr. Sean Trulov and Dr. Paul Spiegel. Thank you for all of, your, all of you for your participations, your excellent questions. Uh, the, the recording of this will be made available to you.